All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, uh, here mid-November. Um, it is a pleasure to be uh, with you all today for the, our uh, most recent vaccine oversight work group. Um, I think the last time that we were here was back in September, right as the school year had begun. So we were really focused in on schools and keeping them open and all of the variety of things that everybody is trying to navigate to make sure that uh, kids can learn in schools every day. Um, since then, uh, the FDA not only has approved booster shots for more populations, uh, it has also approved vaccines for children aged five to 11. Um, my two kids are gladly in that, uh, in that line. They have gotten their first shots. Uh, and fortunately, more and more, thousands more are getting it each day. Uh, you know, from my perspective, this was sort of the last big hurdle out there. And um, I know that the department has been working very hard to to get those out as quickly as possible, lots of school vaccination uh, messages going out and vaccines going out to young people across the state. Uh, getting through this last little piece sort of feels like the final, final hurdle, uh, knock on wood, barring any other dramatic circumstances. You know, at the end of the day, as we kind of think about the, the winter months coming up here, I just can't reiterate enough how critical it is that we keep kids in school. Um, I think We've seen the benefits of them being back in person statewide. Uh, the more we can do that and make sure that that is the case, uh, the better off our state will be overall. Um, so with that, uh, we will hear from Mr. Michael Powell, Director of the Office of Program Evaluation and Government Accountability uh, to get an update on the vaccine distribution. We'll then hear from the Secretary and then Senators. Uh, I will ask a, a few questions, then we'll move to Senator Washington, Rosabeth, Lamb, Young, Eckert with about five minutes apiece. Uh, and we will be uh, through 5 p.m. So without further ado, Mr. Powell, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And uh, Sally, if we could put my slides up. Excellent. So this shows the positivity rate, which is a good measure of COVID in the state. You can see in the summer, beginning of the summer, it had dipped down close to half a percent. Um, towards uh, the end of summer when school was opening, it was up around five. And uh, most recently, it's just over three, um, just for context on COVID in the state of Maryland. Could you go to the next one, please? This shows the positivity rate um, along with the number of tests. And what's interesting about this is that generally they've moved together so that when um, you know, there are more cases and the positivity rates up, more people go and tested. What we've seen this fall is that even while the positivity rate has declined, the, um, the number of tests has, has remained high or even gone up in some cases. So I think that's a good measure that we'll continue to watch. Um, the next slide should show a map by zip code of new cases since the end of the summer. Um, these are case rates. So uh, a larger circle is a more populated zip code. A darker circle has higher case rates. You can see that generally case rates are low in the kind of Baltimore, Washington corridor um, and higher as you get into the less densely populated areas of the state. Um, as usual, I'll warn you not to concentrate too much on one particular zip code because there are some vagaries in this data, but just generally um, gives you a picture of where case rates are high and low in the state. Um, I will point out that as of Friday, I believe Garrett County, had the highest rate, it was 16.6%, and Montgomery County had uh, the lowest, which was 1.6%, so uh, a tenth of the rate um, in Western Maryland. Um, this shows uh, new case rates by age cohort. Um, it's still highest for kids, so zero to, to nine and 10 to 19, um, but not dramatically higher than it is for other age, courts, age cohorts, and it is lowest for seniors. So those uh, in their 70s or over 80. Next slide, please. This shows new case rates by race or ethnicity. Um, for the last month or so, it's been highest for white Marylanders, um, uh, but pretty close to what it is for some other races. Next slide, please. Um, on this one, we look at the positivity rate. That's the blue line compared to the average number of daily COVID deaths. Um, and that has um, also declined lately, which is expected as the positivity rate has declined. I'm not sure if that sort of dramatic drop off at the end is real. I hope it is, um, or if it's because sometimes it takes a couple of days for that data to be um, collected and accounted for appropriately. 
Um, next one, same thing, blue line is the positivity rate, orange line is number of hospitalizations. I believe on MDH website this morning, it was under 500 uh, people hospitalized for COVID related illnesses right now in Maryland. That it, uh, you know, that was about a thousand um, back in August, so about half of what it was then. Um, we'll move on to vaccinations. Um, this shows all vaccinations, except I think boosters um, since the beginning of time. Um, that had been relatively steady over the summer and gotten down to maybe 7,000 shots a day um, until recently, uh, um, as uh, the president pointed out, um, five to 11 year olds became eligible to be vaccinated. And so it started to move upwards towards around, it was 12,000 a day um, when we looked at this on Friday. Um, I suspect that's probably going to continue to increase. Um, as of today, I think 60,000 kids in that age range uh, have gotten a first dose, and that's about 11.5% of that age cohort. Um, map shows vaccination rates by zip code. So similar to the last um, map that we saw, this is sort of the inverse of that. The highest vaccination rates are, again, in the Baltimore-Washington corridor generally, um, and less so as you move away from the most densely populated areas in Maryland. Um, Next slide, please. Um, this shows how we compare to other states in DC when it comes to partial vaccination and full vaccination rate. We're uh, 13th out of 51 in partial vaccination and eighth out of 51 in full vaccination rate. This has been relatively consistent over the last couple of months. Next one, please. So this, I think, shows the impact of the five to 11 year olds being able to get vaccinated. So um, this shows first doses by race or, race or ethnicity, regardless of age, but you can see um, throughout the summer, it was um, lowest for white and Asian Marylanders, um, simply because I think many of those folks who wanted to get vaccinated got their first dose before the summer began. Um, but as the five to 11 year olds have been eligible to be vaccinated, they have um, sort of jumped. Uh, the rates are up 213% for Asians, 180% uh, for white Marylanders, 120% uh, for Hispanic or Latino Marylanders, and 22% for black or African American Marylanders. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we see something similar when we look at the different jurisdictions. So um, the blue line that has made the largest increase is uh, Montgomery County. Um, and I believe that is, let me check my notes here. Um, so uh, Prince George's County, since the, the kids were able to be vaccinated, their new vaccination rate is up 58%, which is good. Montgomery County's is up 341%. Um, so uh, the increase in vaccination has not been even across the counties. Um, and then the final slide just shows all of the jurisdictions in the state. Um, and it shows both their recent vaccination rate, which would be the further to the right you are on this graph, and the cumulative vaccination rate, which would be the higher you are on this graph. So you can see Howard County and Montgomery County are both highly vaccinated, but also have jumped towards the front of the pack recently um, uh, presumably because the young kids are able to be vaccinated and parents there are taking their kids to get that done. Um, that concludes uh, the material that we have. I'm happy to answer any questions and thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Powell. Appreciate that uh, presentation as always. Again, it looks like there's uh, significant progress happening across the board. Let's hand it over to um, Secretary Schrader uh, for the department's update. Thank you, Mr. President. And good afternoon, senators, as always. Uh, I do appreciate the opportunity to provide you an update on our response and recovery efforts. Uh, basically, in order to keep everybody protected and maintain their immunity and stop the spread, uh, we continue to be focused on four key areas. Uh, one, uh, vaccinating the unvaccinated. Two, maintaining immunity by uh, administering booster shots. Uh, vaccinating our five to 11 year olds and, in, and uh, ensuring accessible testing. Uh, before I discuss each of these, I'd like to begin with some of our latest uh, numbers, and I'll go through these uh, quickly. Uh, some of them were already covered uh, by Mr. Powell, but uh, so far we've administered 8.9 million vac vaccinations, and that includes our bo uh, boosters. Uh, we've got 4 million who are 
fully vaccinated and 86% of our 12 plus population has at least one dose. Uh, we have also, uh, uh, as of today, 80, 86%, as it says here, has one dose, but the, the, the number that is really important uh, from a vulnerability perspective is that we vaccinated 99% of our Marylanders who are 65 and older. Uh, this is, as you can imagine, quite an, uh, an achievement. It's a testament to the state's focus on protecting the vulnerable. Uh, our seven-day average is 3.3% uh, uh, for positivity, and our seven-day average case rate is 13.5%. Uh, uh, and our hospitalizations are also still among uh, some of the lowest uh, in the country. Uh, I want to talk a little bit next about the unvaccinated. Uh, we continue to seek out and encourage uh, unvaccinated Marylanders to get vaccinated. They are at the highest risk of getting COVID. 66% of our new cases uh, continue to occur in unvaccinated Marylanders. Of particular note, however, more than two-thirds of our unvaccinated residents are Medicaid recipients. Uh, we are not alone as uh, this is a national ins uh, issue, and we've been working with the nine managed care organizations in the state on initiatives to vaccinate these approximately 500,000 unvaccinated uh, individuals. Uh, and. 49.6% of our Medicaid uh, beneficiaries have received at least one shot after steady outreach since this past summer. Uh, in addition, last Monday, uh, uh, the uh, MDH staff and I attended a White House town hall that focused on bolstering stronger public-private partnerships with the managed care organizations and other states. We heard from Ohio, Massachusetts, Illinois, and California on the challenges uh, that uh, are similar to ours. And I am happy to report that we have already implemented many of the best practices that they discussed to increase vaccinations among Medicaid recipients and uh, are looking at the remainder. Uh, we, in fact, prioritized uh, federally qualified health centers and this population since the very beginning of our vaccination efforts in January this year. And we have been using uh, zip code analysis uh, for Medicaid data to conduct outreach and scheduling vaccination clinics in communities. Uh, and that was uh, one of the themes that was mentioned on the White House call. White House call. Uh, we've also been working, uh, as you know, with the Vaccine Equity Task Force, Brigadier General Burkhead, and her team have eight field vaccination units in, in the field that are conducting more than 30 clinics a week, uh, every day of the week in areas where Medicaid recipients live and work. Our state contracted mobile units are conducting about 70 vaccination clinics uh, each week as well. And we, ha we now have nearly 100 mobile clinics administering thousands of vaccines a week throughout the state. If someone uh, or a group wants a clinic, uh, we urge them to go to our uh, website, governor.maryland.gov slash govaxmobile, or call the, 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 uh, the call center, 855-MD-GOVAX, uh, to request a no-cost vaccine clinic. So um, that, that, that covers the, that very important issue, which we are gonna continue to, to remain vigilant. Um, in, the, in addition to that, uh, we've been administering first and second uh, vaccine doses. Our mobile units are also uh, 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 issuing uh, these uh, booster shots. Uh, they're part of our network of vaccination providers that includes pharmacies, primary care physicians, community health centers, and local health departments. And they've all been administering boosters and other COVID shots to anyone who needs one. On September 24th, as you know, the CDC recommended the Pfizer vaccine for a booster shot. And on October 22nd, they recommended the Moderna and Johnson & Johnson vaccines for boosters and widened the guidance surrounding booster eligibility. 
making it even more convenient is the fact that it's safe to mix and match the vaccines now. This means that eligible Marylanders may now choose which vaccine they want for a booster, uh, even if it's different from what they received initially. We continue to strongly encourage all eligible Marylanders, especially those who are immuno immunocompromised or have comorbidities, to get a booster shot immediately. And booster shots, we believe, are essential to maintaining immunity. We have also instructed providers across the state to vaccinate any Marylander who self-attests that they are eligible for a booster shot. And as with many vaccines, the COVID-19 vaccines have a limitation in their durability. Over time, the uh, protection from these vaccines that uh, we've been given, including Delta and other variants, is naturally going to wane. This does not mean that individuals lose protection from the vaccine, uh, but what it does mean is that you may need a booster to maintain the highest possible immunity, uh, and many eligible Marylanders are now at this stage. Uh, my wife and I recently became eligible and got our booster shots late at night a few weeks ago. Uh, we went online and found that a CVS near us had appointments. Uh, it was actually a tremendous 24-7 operation that worked exactly how we intended it. And uh, very rapidly, we now have achieved 718,000 booster shots, which is half of what we estimate uh, the eligible population is at the moment. We currently rank sixth nationally in booster shots, and, uh, but we're far from done. And again, it's worth repeating, uh, we believe boosters are critical to maintaining immunity, and we encourage everyone who's eligible to get one. Uh, several weeks ago, we began planning to vaccinate 5- to 11-year-olds, and we estimated about 518,000 in the state, and we were very excited when CDC approved the vaccine for this population on November 3rd. Uh, our 5 to 11 year olds, like all of us, have been at risk of contracting COVID throughout the pandemic, and now it's their turn and our responsibility to ensure parents have the information they need to get their children vaccinated. Uh, on November 3rd, we instructed Maryland providers to immediately begin scheduling appointments, holding clinics, and vaccinating uh, this population. Our planning included a proactive outreach to public school systems. Uh, and we made it clear that we believe school-based clinics are the most efficient and effective way to provide equitable vaccinations to our five and 11-year-olds, particularly vulnerable children, and we're, we are encouraging schools to hold clinics. Uh, we've had proactive outreach to non-public schools offering any support they may need, and we've been ensuring schools, local health departments, and others that they, can, they will have the staffing and other resources needed. Uh, we've conducted direct outreach to parents and guardians of 5 to 11 year olds through text messages from our call center, and we've been preparing a host of communication materials, uh, including toolkits, social media posts, public service announcements, etc., uh, featuring trusted pediatricians. Uh, and we've updated our covidvax.maryland.gov uh, website so that folks can find the vaccinations near them online, and we're working to determine the number of doses Maryland would receive from the federal government uh, and using our established vaccine uh, distribution system. We are less than two weeks in, and we've received and distributed across the state more than 181,000 doses to providers in our network based on our initial allocation given to us by the federal government. In addition, the federal government has distributed an additional 105,000 doses directly to pharmacies in the state. They plan to allocate doses directly to states on, and pharmacies on a weekly basis moving forward, and we do not anticipate any supply issues. As of today, as was mentioned earlier, more than uh, 59,000, close to 60,000 uh, 5-year-old, 11-year-olds have received their first dose of the two-dose regimen. Uh, and they have been vaccinated in pediatricians' offices, schools, local health departments, and pharmacies. I visited a 5- to 11-year-old uh, clinic at Digital Harbor High School in Baltimore and Northwest High School in Adelphi this past Wednesday and was at a clinic hosted by the NAACP in Baltimore Saturday morning. 
I saw a lot of relieved parents and excited children. Uh, we are out of the gate strong and are re already one of the leading the states vaccinating 5 to 11 year olds. We need to maintain our momentum, however, as we enter the holiday season and into the colder winter months. Uh, I'm going to conclude by just saying a few words about testing. Vaccinations and testing remain the two main most valuable and effective tools we have to protect ourselves. Uh, Maryland's K through 12 uh, COVID-19 testing is working well. The goal is to reduce the infection spread by identifying infected persons who may be asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic for isolation and identification of close contacts. 21 of the state's 21 school systems enroll in our K-12 screening testing program and uh, we are testing uh, on an ongoing basis at 360 schools. There are also 61 non-public schools participating and as of October 26, the, the school screening testing program has facilitated 369,000 plus PCR tested tests that resulted in uh, 1,974 uh, positives. And as of October 26, we have 16 public school systems that are part of our K through 12 diagnostic school testing program. In addition, we continue to average 20 to 30,000 tests a day for residents statewide and with most labs reporting results within one to two days. We're strongly encouraged that, encouraging Maryland's who test positive uh, uh, or have been exposed to someone to immediately ask their physician about monoclonal antibody treatment and to go, one of the, to go with the, one of the facilities across the state that are administering these treatments. Uh, we've already uh, administered 20,000 uh, plus uh, total infusions and we have ample supply to meet the demand. Simultaneously, we're enhancing our outreach to strongly encourage physicians to discuss and offer mono, uh, monoclonal antibody treatments to people who are infected. Lastly, our call center, 855-MD-GO-VAX, stands ready to help anyone make a vaccine appointment or answer uh, any of their questions. And again, thank you for the opportunity, centers. I know there's a lot of information, but there's been a tremendous amount that's been going on in the last six weeks since we last met, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Greatly appreciate the presentation as always, um, and certainly some, some good news on, on many different fronts. Just, uh, I have uh, kind of two basic questions. The first one is on the booster. Just, uh, there has been some, you know, uh, lack of clear understanding as to who is exactly eligible. Is it is it the place right now in Maryland that if you are within the time frame window of your initial shot that that all adults 18 or over are eligible for a booster? Is that the case? It's uh, all adults 65 and over uh, who have uh, been uh, vaccinated, uh, whose last vaccination was six months ago. Uh, and anybody 18 and over who's in a high-risk occupation or has a comorbidity or underlying medical condition. We are still discussing what to do, you know, next, and uh, we're having those conversations, but that's the current situation. And are we, are we seeing sufficient, more than sufficient demand, uh, I mean, sorry, supply of vaccines? I mean, are we at a place where we are yeah. fully... Yeah, so we're, we, we actually kept supply in state when others were giving it back and we kept it. So we're in very good shape for supply uh, going forward. That's great. Is there a, I mean, is there, a, is there a harm or health risk of getting a booster unnecessarily? I mean, I guess, is that the last sort of outstanding question? I guess, but yeah. overall, is there a reason not to get the booster that we would hold back? Is there a reason to hold back on booster delivery if it is, we're not going to send it to other places where there's lower rates is my guess, but. Right, right, right. So, I mean, what we have said is uh, people can self attest if they feel they, they're eligible based on the criteria, but we are having the, the very conversation internally about, okay, what's next? And uh, that is a debate that we're hearing is happening around the country. Uh, we definitely, anybody who's over two months for J&J &J should definitely go and get a booster. Uh, for uh, Pfizer and Moderna, 
we're we're very we're having those conversations. We're not ready to make an announcement today, but uh, we okay. definitely are looking closely at that issue. Great. Um, other quick question is around um, students. I mean, it's only been I think two weeks at this point, so it's hard to say that there's exact trend. You know, I think at the early end of the adult distribution, this was definitely on the supply issue, but. Are, are we seeing any disparities in the, the five to 11 year old uptake racial or, or socioeconomic disparities in who is getting the boost or who is getting the initial vaccine, the kids? It, it's, uh, it's a little early. We've got 10, 10 and a half, 11 and a half percent so far. We're going to be looking at those numbers this week uh, to see if uh, where that is. But we right out of the gate, we talked to the schools and the local health departments and said that we believe that in order to get equitable distribution, we need to do the uh, vaccinations in schools. Uh, and we gave uh, the, uh, the, the distribution uh, pro, was done pro rata, but it was also geared heavily towards the local health departments so that we knew that we had vaccine available any, uh, throughout the state. That's great. And just want to affirm that choice. I think the more in schools, the easier it is, the more opt out, you know, uh, it, they're, they're going to, they're going to be there. So great place right. to catch exactly. them. <laughs> um, we agree. <laughs> yeah. uh, all right. Uh, Senator Washington, you have five minutes. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Secretary Schrader. Um, I was just reflecting back. We've been doing this for a while and definitely there are uh, sort of lessons learned uh, with this, this round. And I guess that's what my question, I have two questions, but I want to start with the sort of more policy um, in terms of if we think of COVID uh, as this as an opportunity really to fix our public health response system broadly, right? We sort of were caught off guard. Um, and if we're gonna to continue to fight this pandemic and frankly address uh, those that may come in the future, I'm wondering from what, what policies, and as we enter in session and what policies do you see uh, us needing to do as a state uh, to really address some of the um, challenges we see. Well, yeah, some of the, the challenges that a lot of our, um, I guess, um, you know, uh, emergency management folks are, are telling us when it comes to our pu public health response. Well, let me see if I can uh, answer that. Uh, that. There's probably four or five questions embedded there. Uh, yeah, we have sorry. been looking very, no, that's great. We've been looking very carefully at the public health emergency management efforts here at the health department and in the state. And uh, we have already actually, we've been implementing lessons learned as we go. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we, have, we have actually, uh, even through the development of our recovery effort, have uh, been making adjustments uh, to, 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 to make sure we do this better. Uh, as far as going forward with uh, the public health response, uh, one of the th areas that I think, uh, you know, through your efforts, uh, we have the, uh, uh, the Health Equity Commission. I think that's an area that uh, we're going to want to take a close look at. And I think uh, just the fact that over the summer, uh, once we came through the mass vax uh, portion of the, uh, of the uh, vaccination, period, we started looking very carefully at the Medicaid uptake. And so uh, that, that didn't catch us off guard. We've been really driving on that issue. So I think uh, there's a number of things that we have already learned, but I think we're going to continue to learn. Uh, unfortunately, we're not, this is far from over. Uh, you know, how we're going to maintain immunity what the role of testing is going forward, I think is gonna evolve uh, and, and what the role of uh, boosters in that immunity or other approaches is going to be a big. So I, I think we're, unfortunately, I wish that wasn't the case. We're gonna be talking about this for quite a while. Right, and so that's why I'm, I, and I know it happens as we learn on the go, are, uh, are we able to document and maybe uh, come up with a report. So I just had sort of five areas that I was interested in. One, it seemed that uh, issues around supply chain uh, is really 
very, very key, um, you know, make sure, make, making sure that we don't, uh, that we have syringes, that we have, you know, every, all the supplies that we need um, there. Secondly, um, it seems like there's interest in exploring our data management. In I think we saw that early on, so I'd be interested in, in what sort of policy recommendations you'd have around there. And then also, I think you're, you're recommending uh, and Senate, I, I'm going to wrap up uh, that uh, we have learned that there has to be different delivery mechanisms suited for different populations. So I think really codifying that in terms of policy and operations and whatever contracts that we write out and, and, and our RFPs that they it is a part of it. Um, and then this is something I think that all of us uh, in the early days, we talked about uh, this balance between targeting and speed. Uh, in the early days, um, it, it seemed that the office was very focused on the speed uh, of which, and then we found that speed resulted in increasing disparities. And so um, I think it would be good for us to look at that. And then finally, um, you know, just figuring out what the, what the next one is going to be uh, and, and how, do we get how do we prepare for that? So that I'm interested as we continue these to really look at what policy implications uh, as we're going through this sort of management and implement, implementation that we really look at how we, how we operate as a, as a health system. So thank you, thank you, Senator President. Thank you, thank you, Secretary. Yeah, no, thank you, uh, Madam Senator. Uh, I will say just very briefly, uh, you've hit on a number of things that we are working on as we speak. Uh, we have, uh, the, for data management, for example, we've built some data marts uh, to help us with the management of the data. And from that, we've learned uh, how to uh, sustain that. Working, We're working closely with uh, MD Think and Do It on uh, how, to, how to capture that data and uh, you know, analyze it quickly and then put it, uh, use it for, uh, for operational purposes. So that's definitely an area. The other thing we've done, uh, unfortunately, uh, I, we learned, we are in the process right now uh, of doing our, uh, our uh, policies around uh, incident management and business continuity with the department. And we're, we're updating uh, those uh, because I think that's very important. I think uh, you probably noticed last week that the governor uh, uh, announced our new uh, data officer for the state, and we'll be working closely with that individual as well as our new, we've set up a data office in the department uh, uh, earlier this year uh, with a gentleman, uh, with uh, Mahesh Marapelli, who has quite a bit of experience. So uh, I think all of what you said is, is uh, fair game and we are looking at it. So we're not standing still, I can assure you. Great, thank you, thank you. Excellent, all right, uh, Senator Rizbeth. Thank you, Mr. President. I wanna follow up on um, Senator Ferguson's um, question about the booster shots. You know, one of the things that's been most frustrating to ordinary people through this whole pandemic has been the changed advice from public health authorities. Put your mask on, take your mask off, get a shot now, get a shot later. Get a test in this situation. Get a test in another situation. On the booster thing, I'm mystified as to why Maryland, unlike other states, and I think unlike some cities, isn't just urging people to get booster shots as soon as they can, if they, qual if they qualify in the sense of they, they got their first shot like six months ago. But why are we saying that people under 65 shouldn't just go out and get a booster shot? What's the downside? I don't get it. Debate on that, Senator. I, I I don't disagree with you actually. That we do not have the, the uh, green light yet from CDC to do that, and so the debate is at whether or not do we just make our own policy. Now, if you recall, we pushed really hard on that for the nursing homes when we did our antibody study, because we wanted to make sure that we had some science behind making that decision. Uh, so they're, 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 uh, you're, you're, you're right, we'd like to move faster. Part of the challenge, too, is providers are very hesitant to uh, give shots because we gave, we gave them the green light to go ahead and give additional doses to people uh, at one point uh, who were immunocompromised, and we still had providers in the state who were a little nervous about that. So it's really a, 
the providers are looking for the health department to give them I know. Uh, the that's, comfort that's, that they're they're going to be okay in doing so. But there's no health argument against it, right? It's it's all institutional nervousness. Well, we we respect the federal government. Obviously, we well, want to respect make the federal sure government too. I respect the federal government. Well, I do, but other states are doing. Well, I would strongly encourage you. I. I don't. Yes. Ar- I would. I won't argue with you, sir. Exactly. Well, I appreciate that. If we could get out front on this, I think it'd be good for everybody. So that I appreciate that. Number two, good point well taken. Yes, and this sir. may be more for our staff than for you, but the charts we had early on seemed to show that on the little kids getting vaccinated, we're way behind on African Americans as a rate, and I believe Prince George's is way behind. I mean, I was sort of stunned by the chart that Mike put up about how how Montgomery County taken out. Now we in Prince George County are always used to Montgomery County like being wonderful people and we love them in Montgomery County. On the other hand, um, they must be doing something that we're not doing in Prince George's to get so many kids vaccinated so quickly. Have you all looked at what's actually happening on the ground that is having these much higher vaccination rates literally in Montgomery County because it, it's a pretty diverse county. I mean, you, you can't say it's all one ethnic group or another ethnic group or one economic group or another ethnic group. It's not like one little place that stands out. It's a, it's, a, it's the biggest county in the state. What are they doing right that other folks aren't doing? Well, a couple of thoughts. Number one, uh, Montgomery, we, we're, we're looking carefully at Montgomery County, uh, but they are, uh, you know, well, as you said, well ahead of the rest of the state. But I'll be honest with you, I've looked at the Prince George's County numbers and Prince George's County has done a pretty good job so far. Uh, getting out in front of this. We're only 10 days into this. So I think I'm reserving judgment uh, until we get, you know, into maybe three or four weeks out. The other thing is that we're finding this is following the 12 to 15 curve pretty closely. And we, all of our planning uh, around this was organized around having a spurt at the, you know, up to three to four weeks and then starting to flatten out. But um, I think from what I could tell, and I'll go back and take a, a second look, I thought Prince George's looked uh, like you got off to a pretty good start. Well, I, ho- hopefully it gets better as well. Last question, going back to the president's point about vaccination in schools. I think vaccination in schools for kids is obviously efficient, particularly for low-income kids who don't have as much connection to, uh, to pediatricians uh, as middle-class folks do. So are you or the health department or I'm sorry, or the uh, MSDE doing anything or going to do anything to really pull together the data around the state. My concern is that some school systems will be great about getting vaccinations in the schools and some won't. And that will create huge disparities where there are kids who ought to have that access that won't get that access. And I do think it's a state responsibility, maybe MSDE, maybe not you guys, to look at that over the next couple of weeks and say, which schools, elementary schools particular, and middle schools, are they not getting shots at school? Yeah, we've had uh, several uh, joint meetings with the local health departments, MSDE, and the uh, state superintendents. I think there's been three, at least three or four of those calls going back a month or so. Uh, and uh, the, the schools have been very, very responsive and we're seeing, uh, you know, we're seeing them uh, jump in with the local health departments as a joint effort. So uh, I'm encouraged. I, I think, you know, we're, we're within 10 days, we've, we've hit, you know, 10 percent, over 10 percent, 11 and a half percent. So I think uh, we're going to track this. We'll know more over the next two or three weeks. But we agree with you. I, I think the most equitable way, and the governor said this, repeatedly, the most equitable way to administer this vaccine, vaccine is through the schools to the children. Excellent. I want to be sure it's going into the schools with the poor kids in particular. So, okay. yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Senator. Uh, next up, Senator Lamb. Yeah, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I do want to kind of follow up on that access issue because I feel like there still is an equity concern here. When you look at the rates of uh, that Mr. Powell showed, African-American, mostly kids at this point, only up 22% in terms of the vaccination rate, but then white uh, probably mostly children again, up 180%. That's an eight times um, greater disparity there. And then you also mentioned that two thirds of the unvaccinated residents so far are Medicaid residents. And so, you know, there's a, 
when you overlay that on top of racial disparities, it sounds like there's still racial disparities going on. I'm concerned about that. Uh, you know, I think using schools would be great, but I haven't heard any specifics about how you're going to use school-based health centers to help uh, facilitate the administration of these vaccines. Can you lay out what exactly you're doing? Because um, I actually had legislation that we passed last year that moved the jurisdiction of school-based health centers from MSDE to wholly within MDH. And so now you should have all the tools to be able to empower school-based health, health centers to be able to help vaccinate kids. What's the department doing to support this? Well, to avoid giving you a 30-minute briefing right now, uh, I will say that uh, the uh, planning has been underway for us, uh, the health department, to take over. We've got an action plan in place uh, that will evolve over the, uh, the next several months. It's effective uh, July 1st of next year uh, where the, the control comes to the health department. So we're, uh, we are right now analyzing the current state uh, of uh, school-based health centers. There are 90 of them, as you know, uh, and we're looking at how they're put together, uh, who's servicing them, what the budgets are. Uh, we're tr we're get we're got to get our hands on how much uh, because it it was being administered mostly as a grant program within MSDE, uh, and as we move it over to the health department, uh, we're going to have a, a much more operational focus, particularly with Medicaid. And I could go on and on. I mean, there's a, a huge, it's a, it's, a, it's a very large lift. Uh, but anybody that's interested at a school-based uh, health center uh, can call our MD, uh, 855-MD-GO-VAX to get support. We can provide mobile uh, clinics, as I mentioned earlier. We've got uh, non-clinical staffing that we can inject into the process. So, uh, but the key, if I want to go back to what I said in the very beginning, we really want the local health departments to work with the uh, school systems uh, in partnership, and then we will feed them the, the resources they need. Okay, so it sounds like a lot of this is still in the planning stages, but as you probably are aware, a lot of these school-based health centers are very under-resourced and, and strapped themselves. So, you know, I assume we'll have another, um, maybe another monthly briefing next month, but at the next briefing, if you could bring forward um, some more details of that, that would be helpful to know. Um, at an earlier MSDE board meeting, um, I think it was last month, it was pointed out that there were 23,000 kids who have missed regular school vaccination. This is not COVID vaccination, but other school vaccination, other vaccinations um, for kids in schools. That's 23,000 uh, as of last month compared to 62 in 2019. So my concern is that a lot of these kids, because they've missed pediatric appointments and, and other doctor's appointments, have not been able to stay on top of or get their um, regular vaccinations for things like measles, mumps, and rubella. What is the department doing to help address that? Yeah, we share your concern, and uh, we've been uh, uh, putting actually a lot of pressure on MSDE to work with the schools. To uh, This is a perennial problem, as you know. Uh, the numbers actually aren't much different this year than they've been year over year for the last many years. Uh, we, uh, we have now uh, cut it by more than half uh, with the latest data since uh, the last letter that we sent out. So. Uh, the school systems and MSDE are, are moving along uh, very nicely. We want them to move uh, quickly, of course, but uh, we are continued to uh, put pressure on them. But uh, again, as I said, this is a perennial problem uh, that is, is not new. Well, the perennial problem, 23,000 as of last month compared to 19 or 62 at the same time in 2019, seems like it's more than just a perennial problem. It seems like either you're saying it's a reporting lag or that there's a real problem here. So I encourage you to, to continue looking at that. My last question, I guess, has to do with, with local health departments. Obviously, health officers and local health departments have been under a lot of pressure. They've been squeezed between state and local governments. Their responses to the county were actually state employees. And with the recent firing of Dr. Bashai, I'm concerned about the politicization of our local health departments, public health leaders and their workforce for jobs, for the job that they're doing and for what MDH has asked them to do. The pandemic has obviously very clearly taken its toll with seven out of 24 jurisdictions having lost their health officers 
just during the duration of the pandemic with morale low. You know, I think a lot of them don't feel like MDH has their back. What are you and the department doing to about the retention of skilled health officers and local health department personnel with institutional knowledge uh, with a pandemic that's still ongoing? Well, you know, we have nothing but praise for our local health officers. They've, uh, they play a critical role and have done a, a terrific job under tremendous pressure. This is a hundred year event and I can't imagine that any health officer that was in the job uh, before this uh, uh, expected the kinds of pressures on the system uh, that we've experienced. So. Uh, we're working closely with the health officers, uh, and uh, as I said, uh, they're they're doing a great job. Well, I, I appreciate that, and I'm glad that you have nothing but praise for them, and, and I as well, but I think the feeling is not mutual from the health officers back to the department, so I urge you to, to relook at that. So, Mr. President, back to you. Uh, thank you, Senator. All right, uh, we have Senator Young. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, how many adults, and I want to stay with the adults because the children are just getting into it. How many adults are still un, unvaccinated and how many adults have only had one shot in Maryland? Uh, we're at about uh, 690,000, or excuse me, 590,000 uh, adults. There's a total of uh, 690,000 uh, individuals 12 and older, so about 100,000 children 12 to 17, and uh, as I said, uh, about uh, 500 uh, some thousand, close to 600,000, uh, 18 and over. They're totally unvaccinated. Totally unvaccinated. And how about just one vaccine, one shot? No, it's, I'm, I'm sorry. They they haven't had one shot. That's right. But how many have only had one shot? Oh, so 18 and over, we've got, um, I'm, I'm sorry, we, we've had at least 4 million uh, 18 and over have had one shot. I'm sorry, yeah, 4.1 million. That have only had, had one shot? Have only had one shot, right. And then fully vaccinated about 3.7 million, that which would be two shots or one shot of J and J. Well, I guess I won't dwell on it, but I'm I'm still for uh, mandates for going in certain places and and whatever because I think this is going to keep coming back. Um, I got my booster uh, down in Florida. And by the way, you didn't even have to have an appointment there. It was just walk in and get it. Uh, but I don't know how long, and I'm sure the health people don't know how long that's going to last. And are we going to keep having to get booster after booster because we won't deal with the people that haven't gotten a vaccination at all? Uh, I, I just... I'm just concerned that this is going to keep repeating itself, that in January after Christmas, we're going to see a big spike again. Um, but um, you said in terms of, I think, I guess it was deaths or hospitalizations, I'm not sure, that about 34% of those people had been vaccinated. Um, yeah, so the, what we're finding uh, is, and I think this is well known that uh, with this particular uh, vaccine and, and uh, virus, the, there is a waning of the immunity. So how often we're going to have to vaccinate will depend a lot on people's uh, individuals in their durability. What we're hoping for next, and this is really over the horizon, uh, is trying to figure out what is the durability within an individual for the vaccine. It's very likely that we're, that's what I said when I actually, when I, my, my opening statement, I said, I wish it wasn't so, but we're going to be talking about this for a long time because the durability of the vaccine is not 
uh, you know, going to be uh, forever, you know, six, eight months, and it will vary between individuals depending on yeah. the individual. So part of the science that's being worked out now with, within the scientific community are testing protocols and trying to understand what the immunity is, but we haven't gotten that far yet. That, that, that's over the horizon. Well, we really need to st stay on the boosters. Um, going back to Senator Rosenbach, but we need to get them for uh, younger groups too. One of the concerns I'm hearing people that haven't been vaccinated now using as an argument not to get vaccinated because people who have been vaccinated are getting it. So if we can't stay tight on that, we're going to have even more trouble ever getting some of the initial people vaccinated. Um, one, just one last thing, uh, re partially relating to something Senator Lamb said. Um, I know a lot of people are getting threats, election officials and health officials. Uh, how much have you seen or got, been reported of health officials getting threatened? Uh, you know, it, it's been mostly anecdotal reported in the news, but uh, I don't have data here to, to be able to talk to. I, I can get back to you on that, Senator. Okay. I, I really think it's kind of important. I understand why you don't have it now, but it's kind of important because that could be one reason we're losing some health workers. Uh, I know we're losing election officials because of that. So I, I, th I think it's important to know how much, and then I think we need to address it in some form. Point well right. taken. We'll, 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 we'll do that. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Senator. And last but most certainly not least, Senator Eckert. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Secretary Schrader and everybody for your good questions. I have a couple just to follow up on, then I have some more substantive ones. The studies on immunity, I think, are really, really important because that's one of the things that I'm hearing in addition to, well, it's people who are vaccinated who are getting sick, um, as well as those who are unvaccinated. So I think any information that we can get out on what we know about immunity is really important. The other issue um, has to do, with, are you getting pushback from parents through the school systems who do not believe their young children should be vaccinated? Unfortunately, we have some folks in our area elected and otherwise who are suggesting that if you get your kids vaccinated, you are merely throwing your kids to experimentation. So my question is, I hope we're getting good sound information out there to parents to combat that. Because uh, I mean, it's pretty rampant down where I am. Um, and in addition to that, I am just appalled at the number of health professionals who are pushing back on this as well. And I've even, you know, when I be, went into nursing school, I lined up and I had to get all my vaccinations and shots, you know, before I even entered nursing school. And I'm almost wondering if there needs to be some discussion, not only within the health professional boards and organizations about just the importance and a review of infectious disease and immunity and the importance of the vaccination and the validity of vaccinations, particularly this new type. Um, and, and do we need to push that down through our higher ed um, institutions? to make sure that every level of health professional or volunteers who are working at hospice and other um, organizations where there are vulnerable populations to drive home the importance of infectious diseases and the community's response to that in addressing immunity 
and, you know, and, and making sure and safety. To me, it's just basic safety. Um, and I can't, I can't tell you, every week I hear from health professionals on this, on why am I expected to be vaccinated and what are you going to do about it? Well, they get a heavy letter from me, so <laughs> it's not real popular on this end. Um, so those, those are issues that are important to me because I think we're going to face a real crisis in the workforce. I agree with Senator Lamb. I think we've got to do some heavy duty work on recruitment and retention of our folks in our health departments, in our agencies, because folks are jumping ship right and left. And it's going to be hard to take care of the next round of outbreak. Um, the other issue real quickly, what are the ages? on our um, hospitalizations. We know that 66% of the new cases are um, unvaccinated, but how many of those cases who are being hospitalized, what are the ages and the breakdown? Well, overall, if you're, if you're talking about children, Senator, we've had seven uh, either children. Either children, uh, any age. Uh, hospitalizations. Uh, we, yeah, I, I don't have the report in front of me, but we have a very detailed report that breaks down all the hospitalizations by age. We, For children, uh, we've seen about 700 hospitalizations overall throughout the entire pandemic. Uh, our hospitalizations continue to be uh, generally older adults who uh, are you know, immunocompromised in one way or another. The deaths are largely still unvaccinated folks. Uh, and we're finding the, uh, the, the, the deaths among younger folks, uh, say in their uh, 40s to 50s, are those who uh, suffer from obesity. Uh, that is actually a very uh, significant comorbidity that we've observed. But uh, yeah. overall, the, the hospitalizations uh, could, we've only had we only have one in the, one child in an ICU today, so those numbers are down uh, for children. But the, you know, as we've mentioned before, we're looking also over the horizon at uh, RSV and flu uh, sometime in late December, January. Uh, that could change the numbers for children. Yeah, that's important because and. The reason is I have a lot of young professionals who are saying, you know, it's only the people who are immunocompromised are the people who are getting sick. And, you know, kind of the sense that people should be taking better care of themselves and then we wouldn't have to worry about get a vaccine. But, I mean, there's a lot of crazy thinking out there. Trust me, you know that as well as I do. So thank you for your good efforts and thank you for the responses. Thank you, Senator. Uh, well, that, that concludes the questions. I do kind of just want to end on a reflection, a, a bit of an impromptu reflection. And I think it's sort of to Senator Eckert's point. You know, I think as this has, has dragged on to everybody's best efforts, you know, the community, the, the, the confusion around, you know, masking and vaccinations and when and where, I think everybody's looking for this sense of like, where are we going? Where, where are we going? And I think until somebody can provide a clear answer of this is where we are going and how and why, it will only further perpetuate misinformation and misunderstanding. I know that that's not a perfect, you know, it's very difficult to do that in this environment, but I just can't reiterate in all of the conversations I'm having, there is a massive amount of fatigue. There's a lot of questions about, you know, uh, if it was about hospitalizations, but hospitalizations are going down, why, you know, why are there still concerns? And so I just think the clarity of the message about where we're headed and what it takes to get us there will be the thing that really is the key, you know, the, the key to the end. Um, I've always thought it was the five to 11 year olds getting vaccinated. That was the final push. And then we can move forward. But it's just some sort of certainty is so desperately needed uh, from, from my own personal experience and through a number of our colleagues. Uh, that certainly is just so, so, so crucial. So uh, with that, thank you as always, uh, Mr. Secretary, members. Uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you all soon uh, in Annapolis in December, and we will follow up on the next date for the vaccine oversight hearing. Uh, let's keep those vaccinations going and let's get through this thing. Yeah.